Welcome to today's special edition of Hashtag Webinar Wednesday. We, today we are going to talk about Israel's new unity coalition, the promise and prospect of this change government with Professor Guy ben Parat from Ben Gurion University. I'm Doug Sesserman and privileged to serve as the CEO of Americans for Ben Gurion University. And for many of you who've joined us before, you know the format. This webinar is called for 30 minutes. And if you give us 30 minutes of your time, we try to give you a glimpse into the future of Israel and one of the most remarkable and vital institutions in the country. So Guy, we had over 300 people register in about a week lead time. So either you are incredibly popular, this subject is really interesting to people, or our audience is just completely confused. So hopefully it's some combination of all of the above, but we're so excited to have you here today. Thank you, great to be here. Before we start, I just want to thank everybody behind the scenes, our Director of Events and Experience, Melody Mahterian, the marketing and events team that, that supports all of this work, uh, Sari Berkovich, Liz Kirshner, and Kara Bortman. We are live on Facebook. So uh, the numbers just keep growing. Also, if after this 30 minute webinar, you haven't had enough for a, of us, please tune in to a rebroadcast of our Celebrating the Remarkable event where Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer receives her first and only honorary doctorate from a university in Israel, Ben Gurion University of the Negev, of course. It will air on cable and satellite television on the Jewish Broadcasting uh, Service at 2 p.m. Eastern. And then once again, an encore presentation this Saturday, June 12th at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you haven't seen this show yet, it's well worth an hour, of, an hour of your time. Thank you. Okay, so Guy, quick little introduction, although you don't need an introduction, since you, you have the record for the, the panelist um, of webinars with the most frequent attendance. We had four elections, in two years time and you've been on four webinars. So uh, that's amazing. But for those of you who aren't familiar with Guy, he does chair the Department of Politics and Government at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. His research and publications focus on Israeli and world politics, of course, the peace process, religion and ethnicity. He received his BA at Tel Aviv University in political science and psychology and then went to the US for his PhD at Johns Hopkins University. Today, he teaches courses on international relations, globalization, religion, politics, and policing, where he's an expert. He's the co-author of the recently released book in English, Policing Citizens, Minority Policy in Israel. And he's also the author of several other award-winning books. He also has a very important vision for Ben Gurion University to create a research center um, at the university that we call the Forum for the Study of Religious Pluralism and also Shared Society. He's the perfect guy for this time. Guy is the perfect guy for this webinar. Okay, so tell us, let's just get started. You know, this coalition, this unity government, this change government, um, we've got representatives from the center, from the right and the left. We haven't seen anything like this before. Some people are saying this is simply about just unseating Netanyahu. Give us your perspective on what just happened. So yes, this is a very unique government, which has not been formed yet. We have to wait until Sunday. And as you know, many things can happen in uh, the hours left. So I think everyone is on its edge to see if this is gonna happen. To a large extent, this was a very personal election, pro and against Netanyahu. And what you have is a coalition based on very different parties who are ideologically very different, but who came to the conclusion for pretty similar reasons that Netanyahu should not continue as prime minister. And many of people that form this new coalition are formerly people who worked with Netanyahu. It's Naftali Bennett, who used to be a close advisor before he became politician. There's Avigdor Lieberman, who was also 
Netanyahu's secretary before becoming politician. Uh, it's Gidon Sal, who came from the Likud party. So you have a very interesting coalition, uh, which is formed on being opposed to Netanyahu and on a belief of what they would say that normalcy must be restored. An act, a working government that works for the people, which they claim has not, we haven't had for the past two years. So as you're speaking, our audience continues to grow, which is just amazing. Thank you all, everyone for attending. If you do have a question, just click on the Q&A function and throughout this webinar, I'll feed these questions to Guy. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Guy. Um, we've never had an Arab party in the history of Israel be part of the potential coalition. Can you just explain how that happened and what that means? Uh, well, that's one of the oddities of this of this of this new government, if it would will form. So, uh, what we had was a large Arab party, the United List. We included within it uh, a wide variety of Arab politicians, uh, religious and secular and ex-communist and more liberal. So we have a very kind of a interesting coalition. And Netanyahu about a year ago began to cater to one of the members of this Arab United List named Mansour Abbas, who is a part of the Muslim party within the large party. He's a kind of an Islamic party. And uh, the proposed the proposal to Mansour Abbas was, let's talk about practical issues. Let's leave aside much of identity and of large politics. Let's talk about the problems of the Arab sector, inequality, lack of policing, uh, uh, opportunities for education. And Mansour Abbas said, you know what? I'll go for that. I'm willing to talk to Netanyahu about uh, cooperating, in order to bring uh, betterment for the Arab lives in Israel. And I'm willing to put aside the Palestinian question. Okay, so less nationalistic, more pragmatic. I mean, you could use different terms for that. Uh, and Netanyahu and his uh, close allies have made Mansour Abbas a potential hero. Here is uh, an Arab politician who's willing to work with us. Uh, but after the election, uh, Mansour Abbas found himself in a very good position. He could negotiate with both sides. But Netanyahu basically legitimated the option of having an Arab party in the coalition, something we never had before. And Abbas joined Netanyahu's opposition uh, because he saw them as uh, more open and more left-leaning, at least some of them, than Netanyahu's coalition. In addition, Netanyahu's coalition includes a very right wing, some would say racist party, who said we would not sit with Abbas. Netanyahu found himself with a problem. He created two parties, an extreme right wing and an Arab party, and they can't sit together in the same coalition. It's like you, I taught my students, like when you, you try to build one of these IKEA furniture and you're left with a piece you can't fit in, that's Netanyahu's position for the past month. His potential coalition includes the Orthodox parties who will stick with him, the extreme right wing who would stick with him. He needs an Arab party to have the 61 majority. But if this party comes in, extreme right moves out. That's the bind he's been in for the past, for the past weeks. I never in my life thought that there would be a metaphor that compared creating a coalition in Israel to building furniture from Ikea. But that makes a lot of sense. Since they fall apart so easily, you know, I'm not saying anything about it. By the way, there's a beautiful Ikea store in Beersheba for those who want True. to visit and shop there the next time they're in Israel. Uh, we are getting a, you know, a lot of questions already. Maury Epner is asking the one that's on everyone's mind. He says, the eight parties obviously joined together, together to oust Netanyahu but what, if anything, can or will the coalition agree on and accomplish beyond getting rid of the current prime minister? It's a good question. I think they can agree on daily working around issues of a budget. Israel does not have a budget for the past year and a half because of Netanyahu's 
way to keep the uh, guns away from the replacement that he promised him. So Israel does, does not have a working government. So they say we will deal with everyday life with the real stuff. Is this enough? Maybe not. However, the problem now for these parties in the coalition that they have no way out. I think the key player here is Naftali Bennett. Naftali Bennett is the leader of the right-wing religious party. And for many years, this party has always been a sectorial party. They were dealing with religious issues and they were right-wing. They were talking about the settlements. Natalie Bennett came in about a decade ago and tried to change this party. He pre presented himself to be a potential prime minister. His kippah was smaller. He was in high tech. He was in a top army unit. In many respects, he looks like Netanyahu, kind of biography, speaks good English. He's not your typical bearded settler. And Bennett tried to position himself as a potential prime minister. He talked about economics. He talks about kind of more strategic way of thinking about the military. So that's the way he presented himself. And for the past decade, he has miserably failed. The party did not gain much votes. It remained a sectoral party. And in one of the last rounds, did not cross the threshold line. Now, in this election, Bennett has made several promises that he can't keep all of them. He promised not to be in collision with the left. He also promised that there will not be a fifth election. And it's either or. And Bennett had to choose. And he zigzagged several times. In the last operation in Gaza, he announced, well, the left-wing large nuclear is dead. After the uh, Gaza affair, he came back and said, okay, maybe you should try that again. The point is now that Bennett, if he leaves this coalition, he is basically, he has nothing. He lost much of his electorate. The only way he can survive politically, if he can stay as a prime minister for a year or two years, prove himself to be an efficient prime minister, and they say, then say, okay, look at me now. I'm your next prime minister. I'm legitimate. I have a kippah. I'm religious, but I can think beyond my group. I can think in universal terms of being the Israeli prime minister. Gidon Saar, another possibility. Gidon Saar left the Likud party, challenged Netanyahu in his own party. Again, if he goes to elections now, he probably would not pass a threshold. So they have nothing in common in many sense, other than not liking Netanyahu, but they don't have an option outside this coalition. Will this be enough? Hard to tell. But at the moment, they have a very strong incentive to stay on board and try to find compromises. So what they will do in the next two years to survive, they'll try to, they'll try to deflect every this divisive issue. Simply put it on the shelf, not now. Now we'll deal with the economy. Now we'll deal with the building the country. Now this is a very, very problematic position, but they're betting on the fact that at the moment they have no option other than this government. Thank you. Uh, let's go back to Bennett for a second. So Yair Lapid received, he, he, Root, the president turned to Yair, Yair Lapid to form this coalition. He received more votes than Naftali Bennett. Um, but Naftali Bennett's going to be the first one who gets a shot at being prime minister. Help us understand um, that negotiation. Okay, so Lapid, uh, I did not vote for Lapid. And I must say that in the last elections, he proved himself to have become a mature politician. He seemed for many years to be very childish like, very emotional. Uh, inconsistent. In this election, he proved himself to be a mature politician. And Lapid kept his ground. In the last election, his party split. Gantz went into the coalition with Netanyahu. Lapid held his ground. He said, I'm not going to sit Netanyahu because this person has uh, criminal charges on, on his head. So he's, he cannot be a prime minister. 
So Lapid kept his position. Now, after this election, Lapid said, I'm going to do everything I can to replace the government. And I'll make these sacrifices. So if I need to bring Bennett in the coalition, and Bennett has a large price to pay, okay? Bennett took a huge leap. Many of his voters are very angry with him. He crossed the lines, according to them. So Lapid is giving Bennett the first two years to be a prime minister, where Bennett will have to face all these challenges. And in two years time, uh, Lapid will become a prime minister. He's also taking a big bet here. I mean, will this government last for four years? It's hard to see that. But I think Lapid's position- So we've gotten a, and, we've gotten a couple of questions about that. Do you, do you believe this government will last or, or it won't last because it's too ideologically not aligned? You know, there, there are so many factors involved here. You know, there are so many things going on here, uh, externally and internally, that, you know, my guess will be as good as anyone here in the crowd. Uh, as I said, members of this coalition, despite being so uh, different from each other and having so much, so little in agreement, have one thing that they understand, that their only chance to survive politically is to hold this coalition together. The only one who can gain from the election is Lapid. Okay, Lapid, I think, has earned among the Israeli public credit for being reliable and consistent and responsible. So if this coalition falls apart, Lapid might actually better himself. The others, whether it's Avigdor Lieberman or Gidon Sal or Naftali Bennett, if they leave this coalition, they might find themselves with nothing. So is this enough to hold this for four years? Hard to say. But again, it's not impossible. Nagai, we, might, we may have to bring you back again because our, our participant numbers keep growing and, the, and we're blowing up with questions on the Q&A. So there's no way we're gonna be able to get to all of it, but I'll try to get to a few more. Uh, Philip Gompertz, who's our recently retired executive uh, from the Southwest region. I know you know Philip well. He's asking, can, can, uh, can Aftali Bennett really be trusted as, to lead this coalition? I think it's a, it's a huge question. I think unlike Lapid, Naftali Bennett is uh, seen by many as immature, as lacking consistency, and uh, as not yet ready. But on the other hand, Naftali Bennett uh, is perceived by many as an honest person, really cares about the country, is patriotic. So, you know, between, you know, uh, the immaturity and the enthusiasm and the kind of a uh, Boy Scout attitude, you know, people will say, you know, it couldn't be worse than Netanyahu, people who oppose Netanyahu, of course. Um, it's a good question. I think, you know, time will tell. We're getting some questions about where does Benny Gantz fit in all this? Uh, well, Benny Gantz uh, has a party of eight members. Uh, he joins the coalition. He will be the defense minister. Um, he, in the last elections, he did better than expected because Benny Gantz was in Netanyahu's coalition. Uh, Netanyahu did not play I mean, fair with him. And it was clear from the get-go that the uh, switch between them of this project was not, not gonna happen. Uh, but in the last months, Gantz proved some backbone when he opposed Netanyahu on many issues. And I think that gained him some ground, that gained him some respect among some of the pop people who say, you know, it's a good guy. I mean, you know, he might not be a very good politician and, you know, he might seem a bit gullible, but, you know, he played his cards as good as he could, and he proved to be an honest politician. And so, as defense minister, this plays to his strength, right? It does. But I think, generally, I think, I think the position around Gantz is a good person, not a very good politician. I don't think he has a chance to become a prime minister, but you can never, you can never tell. But uh, it was enough to gain about, I think it's about eight seats in, in the parliament, simply by the fact that he stood, held his ground, 
and was perceived like a honest person among the crooks. I mean, that's the image that he created. We're getting uh, two questions that are similar, one from Stuart Karlinski and one from Jacques Gross, by the way, thank you for joining us, um, about will the budget be used to change some policy related to the ultra-Orthodox? Um, good question. Uh, again, it's hard to tell. Remember that the ultra-Orthodox are out now, but people have a, a timeline, they have a, a, a horizon. And they know that at some point they will need the, the ultra-Orthodox on their side. So if you're a politician, you have a, a look for the long run, you don't want to uh, offend the ultra-Orthodox too much. So there might be some changes. Many, many, maybe- the, the Theoretically, fight. because the ultra-Orthodox are not part of the coalition, it does weaken their power, right? In policy making? Yes, in the short term it does. But again, uh, I think most politicians in this coalition are experienced enough to know that in not so in the long run, they might need to bring them in. And there will be another elections. And if they want to break this uh, strong coalition between the Likud and the ultra-Orthodox, uh, they might not want to offend them that much. So I think there'll be some changes. I don't think there'll be major changes. I'm sorry. You have to take into account also that the ultra orthodox is a very poor and large population, uh, and many of the budgets are about alleviating poverty. So you have large families with housing issues. So I don't think anyone plans to to starve them to death. I mean that's that's not that's not in the budget. Um, so maybe some funding will be taken off. I don't think it's going to be dramatic. I mean that'll be my bet. Thank you. That that was that was a great answer. So uh, something that's gotten a little lost in like the mainstream press, at least in this country, is that Israel also announced recently that the Isaac Bougi Herzog will become the 11th president of Israel with great support from the Knesset. Um, so tell us just a little bit about that position, because I know it's confusing for some of us in the States. Israel has both a president and a prime minister, but they have significantly different powers. Could you just tell us a little bit about that? What, what, what we should expect from Bougie Herzog? So it's not a very important role throughout the year. So the president of Israel is elected by the parliament on a secret ballot. So they don't know who voted for them. It's behind the curtains. And Herzog has won uh, by 87 to 33 votes which is a huge victory. Uh, he was competing against a, a, an orthodox, orthodox woman, Miriam Peretz, who became famous because she's a bereaved mother. Her two sons were killed in the military. She's also a very known for her education activities. She's, a, she was, she's been a, a, a school, uh, uh, she, she was a, uh, an educator. And she's a very impressive person, all the, all the other. And, but Herzog is a very experienced politician. He worked behind the scenes very well. Uh, and he gained a, a very, very uh, significant victory. But the president has two important roles that should be taken into account. First, the president, after election, decides which of the parties will get to form a coalition. And then he has some leeway. So the parties come to the president after the election. And he asked each party, who do you nominate for a prime minister? Who is your preferred candidate? And then he says, according to what I've heard, I will let Netanyahu try and build a coalition. So that's what happened now. So the current president, Ruby Ruby Rivlin, after the election, gave Netanyahu the uh, mandate to form a coalition. Netanyahu failed because of what I said before. It, he came back to the president, he gave it to Yair Lapid, and Yair Lapid succeeded. So that's how it works. So one important role is after the election, the president gives the mandate to the person he believes has the greatest chance to form a coalition. The second important role is pardons. The president has the right to give pardons to people who were tried. And here you have all the conspiracy theories. Was there a deal behind uh, the curtains that the next president will pardon Netanyahu if he is indicted. Now, wow. 
I have no idea if that's true or not. Nobody does. That's but like out of the Wizard of Oz or something. It is. But that shows you why this election did have some importance considering the current situation and how people perceive, whether it's true or doesn't matter, people perceive the president as the authority to pardon indicted uh, people. Netanyahu is on trial. So one-on-one -on -one might equal two. But again, there is no proof for that. Incredible. Okay, so we have we have a uh, we have some some more questions. Um, John Edelman's asking as it relates to Israel's parliamentary democracy. Do we think that this is going to this experience over the last four years is going to change um, Israel's policies, uh, things such as term limits, et cetera, down the road? so that, that it doesn't appear to look more like a monarchy? So this is a, a debate that goes on in Israel for years. I mean, does the election system work? I mean, this, this, does this parliamentary and coalition system work? Should we replace that? Um, Israel tried about 15 years ago a direct election of prime ministers. So people had two, uh, two votes, one for the prime minister, one for the parties. And the change was supposed to bring more stability. Well, it brought the opposite. People said, I like Netanyahu as a prime minister, but now I can vote for a small party, which I like even more. So the prime minister was elected by the popular vote, but the coalition was based on many small parties, which is very hard to bring together. So they brought the system back to where it was before. So back to the regular election system. Uh, but so, in the Israeli system, there aren't term limits like we have. You could serve for two four-year terms. In Israel, if you can no, keep there, building there a no coalition... You because, can... because you don't vote for a person. You vote for a party, not for a right. person. That's why there are no term limits. And also, uh, before Netanyahu, this does not seem to be a problem. So now they are raising the issue of term limits. Um, but you know, this is people say this is a personal vote against Netanyahu. So you're trying to prevent him from returning. This is unfair. You don't make a, a decision based on a personal attitude towards someone. So it's on the table now, the term limits. Uh, will this apply in retrospect? Or will we start from now? So let's say two years from now, Netanyahu comes again for election. So we start now, Kevin with the terms. Or do we also account for what the world wants he had before? I think, okay. I mean, and I'm not a Netanyahu supporter, as you may have heard the, the music, it, it is a bit unfair. At the prerogative of the moderator, we're just going to go for a couple minutes longer because, I, and I know it's getting late in Israel, but we just have so many interesting questions. So uh, people are asking, do you think this is going to hold this coalition or are there some last minute tricks or strategies up Netanyahu's sleeve that will change things? Someone told me today that uh, Netanyahu, uh, like a cat, has nine lives. He only used seven of them. So there are two more up his sleeve. Um, it's hard to tell. At the moment, this coalition seems to be stable, as a coalition, this can be stable. So they have 61 people who are going to vote for this coalition, which should be enough. Having said that, 61 is a very, very small margin. Enough that one or two people will cross the line, everything changes. Uh, will Tanya be able to pull a trick up his sleeve until some, by, by Sunday? Hard to, to see that happening, but not impossible. Members of his party today say, we're going to the opposition, we're ready. We understand that, game over. Uh, but It's already, it's Wednesday night, tomorrow's Thursday, then you have Shabbat and then it's Sunday. Well, you know, it's Pikuch Nefesh, so people might do on Shabbat, you know, uh, people on Shabbat might do some work. But okay, uh, one, one last question on the Arab party. Um, Israel just got through, I don't know, got through, but there's a ceasefire with Hamas. We had civil unrest like we hadn't really experienced before. Um, if there are more rocket attacks or another, uh, something that provokes more civil unrest, do you think that that puts risk to the Arab party being part of this coalition? Yes, that's one of the external events that could destabilize this coalition. Uh, 
Abbas comes in as a pragmatic politician. I mean, pragmatism can be good or bad. I mean, you can choose. But Abbas said, I am not looking to solve the Palestinian question, not looking to solve the identity question. I'm here to improve Arab lives. And being in this coalition, I can bring in the dough. I can make things happen. I can build new Bedouin settlements in the Negev. I can uh, end demolishing of houses. I can bring budgets. That's what I'm in for. And if I work with the government and make gains for Arab people, I will be voted again. That's his calculation. And that, that's your, your sense of his having a pragmatist ideology as opposed to just a pure uh, ideology around uh, two-state solution, et cetera. You know, you, you could say this is good or bad. I mean, you know, we could discuss whether this is pragmatic or this is cowardly or this is cynical. You know, we can all have our own opinions about that. But Abbas has split from the United Arab List because he was willing to forego for the time being these questions of Palestinian nationalism and of identity in return for real gains. Uh, will this tactic be beneficial for him? Hard to tell. But again, like the other parties, he has a large stake in holding this coalition together. Because if this coalition falls apart and he goes back to elections, then he might lose everything. Because the Arab list will tell the voters, here Abbas tried, look what happened, pragmatism does not work. Let's go back to basics and fight for our rights. So Abbas also has a very large stake in this coalition holding together. Um, so will Operation Gaza make it fall apart? Good chance, but not necessarily. So I wanna just thank you, Professor Guy Ben Parat for joining us once again, you know, your insight and honesty uh, in, in helping us understand the situation is just really incredible. So we, we greatly appreciate it. For those who haven't had enough, uh, just a few minutes ago, celebrating the remarkable Encore presentation started on Jewish Broadcasting Service on cable and sal satellite television. So you can tune in just after this. And if you wanna watch our next webinar on June the 23rd at our regular time, uh, noon Eastern, we will be doing a webinar with Moisha House on um, next what we call Next Gen B7, B7 or Next Gen Be'er Sheva and how the young people are helping to revitalize um, the community of Beersheba, which is also home to our main campus. David Ben-Gurion, the founder of Israel and first prime minister, and the person that we're proud to have as the namesake of our university, once said that the test of democracy is the freedom of its criticism. And on that measure, I think Israel has an incredibly robust democracy. So once again, thank you all for joining us and thank you very much Professor Guy Ben-Parat. Thank you, good night.